onto these websites to, for the wider audience. And uh, uh, today is the second session, and the chair of this session is um, my colleague in the University of Cambridge, uh, Dr. Timur Nocta, um, who uh, is a research fellow um, in the Center for uh, Smart Infrastructure and Construction, in particular, um, a lead uh, research fellow uh, in the project called Digital Cities for Change. And uh, very appropriately, um, we invited her to chair this session. And I'm going to hand over to Timana now for her to introduce the speakers and the discussants. Thank you. Thank you, Ying. So, um... First of all, I would like to join uh, Yang and Vach among our presenters and also the audience to today's session. Um, so, um, as mentioned, my name is Tima Nokta and I will be your session chair today. Um, to introduce myself maybe a little bit, um, I have an interdisciplinary background rooted in both architecture and public policy and administration. And um, um, again, as Ying mentioned, I work at the Center for Smart Infrastructure and Construction, where I lead the urban governance stream of a major research project entitled um, Digital Cities for Change, uh, which is funded by the OVERB Foundation. And with the project's aim being the development of educational material to support uh, city managers in leading digitalization in their cities. Um, my research actually revolves around how smart technologies that rely on data analytics and urban models may influence policy decision-making in multi-actor urban governance processes. So the smartification agenda has been an emerging trend in urban planning and management uh, driven by digitalization and also an increasing demand for more evidence-based policy. However, it is unclear whether and to what extent the COVID-19 pandemic and its effect will impact on dominant urban trends, goals and priorities in different places. So today's session entitled, entitled Status Report Around the Globe is the first one of the 2020 series focusing on a specific issue. And to address it, our speakers today, Professor Yoshi Hayashi and Professor Bert Van Vee, Van Vee will consider the world we are in and how applied urban models could contribute to responding to these contemporary challenges. So without further ado, let me turn to today's first speaker, Professor Yoshi Hayashi. Yoshi is a professor at Shibu University in Japan. He is a full member of the Club of Rome, a high profile international organization aimed at addressing the multiple crises facing humanity and the planet. And he is uh, president of the World Conference on Transport Research Society. His talk will discuss the impacts of, COVID, of the COVID-19 pandemic in transport and land use based on the results of an expert survey conducted among the members of the World Conference on Transport uh, Research Society. I should add that if you have any uh, clarification questions, uh, please post them in the Q&A and we will pick these, straight, pick these up straight after the talk. So uh, Yoshi, over to you. Thank you very much for your very kind introduction. Uh, may I share my slide uh, to start with? Now uh, you can see my slide. Yes. Okay. Okay, so now. Um, Today, uh, I will talk about uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic's uh, impacts uh, in the sector of uh, transport and land use. Um, uh, World Conference on Transport Research Society, WCTRS, uh, conducted the uh, expert survey uh, end of uh, uh, April. So uh, I will uh, introduce that and then extend um, uh, our interpretations. So this is the team of uh, task force, uh, myself, uh, Chair, and uh, Juni Jan. Uh, so he's a brilliant researcher uh, helping me, and uh, also uh, some advisors like this. Uh, now, uh, what have happened uh, in transport under COVID? Uh, uh, now, uh, according to our survey, uh, please mind this is at the end of April, right? 
uh, so uh, just uh, multiple choice of the uh, so subjective observations. Okay. So uh, from sorry, from public transport to car, thirty five percent. So. Okay, by the way, uh, more than uh, around the 330 uh, responses from the members of uh, WCTRS or TRB or ITF, uh, many others from all over the world. Uh, <clears throat> then, uh, so this is uh, the, the average figure uh, public transport to motorcycle. This is uh, bad side in terms of carbon emission, uh, increasing carbon emissions. On the other side, uh, moving to bicycle, to walking, uh, these are a green uh, shift. Okay. Now, uh, looking at uh, uh, the, the phenomena uh, uh, by country, so now uh, going to, uh, shifting to car uh, to korea this uh, dark blue is korea south korea is a champion and then uh, followed by china okay and then uh, motorcycle india and uh, uh, other asia are uh, the biggest other asia mainly southeast asia uh, to walking uh, uh, india and uh, europe and the bicycle, uh, Europe is the highest. So uh, India and uh, to walking, the reason may be different. Uh, the case of uh, Europe, walking is maybe healthier, but uh, India's case, uh, because of income discrepancies, uh, very low income people, they cannot afford any uh, car or motorcycle just to walk, no, no other option. And then uh, to bicycle, perhaps uh, this is uh, well, reflecting the effort of uh, European countries uh, in the past 30 years or so, uh, improving uh, bicycle lanes. Now, uh, we see a, a, this uh, uh, figure. Uh, so uh, workplace is red. So this, this is a uh, uh, Google, uh, Google Community uh, Mobility Report. Uh, workplace red, uh, residential place, so the staying at home is uh, green, and then uh, just uh, standing at uh, uh, transit stations, railway stations also. So Japan is like this, and uh, we did not uh, lock down, but uh, uh, emergency declaration we did. So not very clear uh, uh, downtown, uh, but the, about about here. So M means March, uh, March 20th or uh, here, and then uh, maybe end of March. And then this is uh, April 20th, etc. So the other countries uh, locked down, the US uh, uh, and uh, US, India, uh, Italy. So immediately uh, come down, workplaces very much less, while uh, green stay at home will be increased. Uh, and then uh, comparing France and Italy, please look at this. There may be a good idea to look at this. Uh, comparing France and Italy, um, uh, transit use, this is this in this figure, green is transit use. Transit use has been uh, lower, but the France case uh, has been recovered. Okay. But this may have uh, brought about higher infection rate in, in France. Uh, now, uh, what are recommended uh, measures and actions? Well, uh, by the experts. So, uh, online meeting, avoid gathering events, uh, uh, telework, uh, online lecture, uh, avoid eating out, uh, physical exercise alone, or like this. So uh, this is uh, about the uh, uh, chair of recommendation. This is a green recommendations to reduce uh, to the CO2 direction. And then to increase is uh, 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 
uh, say uh, several others uh, anyway. And then <clears throat> now we look at uh, expert opinions on uh, on long term changes. Uh, so uh, more and more intercity business trips uh, for meeting will be uh, replaced by online meeting. Uh, about 80% uh, or more than 80% uh, experts answered like this. Or online services, government, bank, uh, ticket purchase, this is uh, 70%, 75%. And then uh, inside those intracity business trips, also uh, replaced by online, is uh, 70%. Uh, online shopping, 60%. Uh, but uh, people is worrying about the isolation of uh, people, uh, between people. Uh, about 50% uh, of answers are worrying about uh, using online or smart technologies. And then online education, uh, say only 30 or 35% recommended. Uh, <clears throat> another one is uh, car dependence uh, will become more obvious uh, due to adverse uh, uh, reactions to crowded public transport is uh, about uh, 60 percent, 60 plus. And then online shopping will become most popular than 60 percent. Uh, more and more people uh, will out out migrate from populated cities so the, to suburbs is uh, a bit more than 20 percent about a bit more than 20 percent is uh, uh, not uh, out suburb other suburb only but uh, live in other re regions uh, this is 20 percent now uh, i will talk about japan what have have done in japan have happened in japan uh, this is uh, the infection numbers, uh, uh, cases like this. Uh, the, the biggest number per day, this is a, a, a per day. Per day, biggest number is uh, a, a bit less than 800. So I, I think this is uh, one order lower than European countries. This was the peak, uh, April. Okay. And, uh, this is until May 17, but uh, we had, we had uh, say last month, another peak, uh, nearly this, uh, but not so much. Now, uh, what uh, have happened uh, in the his historical uh, listing, <laughs> uh, general measures taken by Japanese government, uh, we had the f found the first infection case uh, January 16, and then WHO announced emergency of international concern, uh, not pandemic. Uh, and then the first death found uh, February uh, 13, so about uh, one month later. And then <clears throat> uh, end of February, uh, First, Japan's uh, first declaration of uh, state of emergency. Uh, this was done by the governor of Hokkaido prefecture, only Hokkaido. Uh, it, it is told uh, uh, there were many uh, foreign uh, visitors at the time and Hokkaido had a, a snow festival in Sapporo, etc. So uh, foreign people, uh, uh, say so China, Asia, uh, uh, other people uh, came here. So um, th that may be uh, the uh, cause. Uh, and uh, March, early March, elementary school, secondary school, high schools uh, uh, temporarily uh, suspended, not to go to school. And then, the March 19, a recommendation of uh, behavior changes by the government task force. So this is interesting, recommendations, not, not order. So this is uh, very interesting and uh, Japanese, uh, reflecting Japanese mentalities. So uh, sometimes very good, sometimes very bad. 
Japanese, you, you may not understand what he or she would like to say, very much vague, <laughs> okay? <laughs> but, uh, okay, look at this. And then, then uh, end of uh, March, Tokyo governor uh, requested, request, okay, self uh, restraint on weekends, not to go outside, okay? And then uh, early April, declared state emergency uh, by seven uh, uh, prefecture governors, uh, including Tokyo and Osaka. Uh, not, not, to, to, not tourists only. Uh, the, this time already uh, ordinarily, uh, say, inhabitants uh, in, uh, infect uh, to each other, not tourists. And then uh, uh, emergency economic budget, uh, one trillion yen. This is about uh, one, uh, so, so 10, uh, 100 trillion yen, this means uh, 1 trillion US dollar, uh, uh, so uh, 0 0.8 uh, trillion uh, uh, pounds, uh, like that, so big money. So this is uh, about the uh, size of annual budget. And later, uh, they, uh, uh, the government uh, increased more, and then uh, now 160 or nearly uh, 200 uh, trillion yen, two, 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 two trillion dollar now. So uh, this is a burden on the next generation, I'm afraid. <clears throat> uh, sorry. Hmm? Okay, and then uh, recommendations of behavior changes by the government task force. Okay. And this is ex expert uh, task force. And then, okay, uh, and then I, I told about this already, sorry, uh, confused. And then uh, declaration of whole country is uh, uh, mid-April. Mm. Sorry, rather unstable. Uh, mid-April, and then, okay, but uh, uh, mid-May, uh, we have uh, 47 prefectures, so uh, uh, 39 prefectures declaration canceled because the uh, infection uh, case was very much down. And then uh, this is uh, uh, effects on railways. This is Shinkansen high-speed rail. This is conventional railways. Um, so uh, this Hokkaido is the biggest uh, is down. Uh, this is because I, I told the uh, governor was, he, he thought very serious. So uh, that means uh, uh, the, the also citizens uh, listen to his voice and then they stopped by themselves uh, like this. But uh, for railway companies, a uh, big damage. So for example, JR East, JR East the Tokyo, Tokyo area, covering Tokyo area. Uh, West is Osaka area, Toka is the Nagoya area, etc. So a big damage. So high-speed rail, about 50% passengers lost. Uh, and then, <clears throat> And what was the impact uh, uh, on railways? Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, for example, in March, uh, so this is uh, reduction uh, of uh, passengers, but among them, commuter pass. We, we have a commuter pass system, uh, one, one month pass or uh, half a year pass. So they, they are commuters. And then this average is uh, including not commuting travelers, all the travelers. So that means, although they have paid already, paid for commuters pass, but they, they stopped. And then um, in April, the uh, expert uh, group of the government, for the government advisory uh, task force, uh, advised a 70 to 80 percent reduction of uh, movement should be uh, achieved, but in reality about 60 percent 
in, in Russia was, in Russia was. Okay. Uh, and then during the golden week, golden week is a long, uh, uh, say about 10 days uh, holiday in, in May. Uh, many people are going for uh, sightseeing, etc. But uh, before that declaration was done, so 90% uh, or more, uh, say, pas passengers down compared with the uh, previous year. Okay. <clears throat> and then now, uh, what kind of measures uh, taken uh, uh, by, sorry, <laughs> by a railway sector, the railway sector, the end of uh, end of uh, January and end of uh, 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 February twice. Uh, <clears throat> sorry. Yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry. Very much unstable. <clears throat> the measures for employees and users. A request is uh, the, the government. A government requested uh, railway operators, uh, so measures for employees and users to, to wear masks and hand washing, installation of uh, uh, anti uh, solution, and requested a prompt report if uh, employee is infect infected. Uh, okay, and uh, the railway stations. Uh, also, uh, say sanitizing uh, uh, alcohol uh, are requested, and then uh, it's interesting. Uh, end of uh, February, railways uh, inside railways guard is an was announcing, please don't don't use railways, please stay at home, <laughs> please stay at home, <laughs> and uh, if you really need uh, not to commute to peak hours. It's very interesting. Uh, uh, my wife uh, uh, has a hobby, horse riding, and then she was so surprised. Railway company, don't come. Don't give, me, give us money. Uh, very strange, but it was very effective. OK. <laughs> uh, okay. So now, uh, this is already done, and then uh, 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 sorry, this this was also done, and then uh, uh, three times, four times, or five times, uh, request the railway operators uh, already. I told uh, sorry, uh, and then request the, the users, passenger, the, the, the company railway company announced, please open the windows, and then uh, don't come do telework, don't ride on our railways, and then cough etiquette. This is very Japanese. Don't uh, uh, loudly cough, okay, with mask, even wearing mask, very, very silently cough. <laughs> so, uh, and then uh, the government announced the financial support. In, so the, the, the 100 uh, trillion uh, yen includes such uh, support. And then some uh, to designate it. This is also interesting. Uh, sorry. Uh, to some of the uh, public transport railway companies, please continue operation. What is this? Okay. Although they, the government is also requesting the company to announce not to ride. So this means to, to, uh, to avoid a dense uh, situation inside of uh, train cars. Okay? So if the, uh, the operation will be reduced, the number of trains are reduced, then, then uh, supply will be smaller. So that means uh, more, more dense inside. Uh, so, so that was... Uh, like this, uh, that means uh, uh, here, request railways, uh, telework, etc. That is uh, about here, about here, and then, then come down. 
Okay, and then uh, also continues. Uh, I have to stop very soon. Refrain uh, from uh, unnecessary and an urgent trips, and then uh, enlightenment uh, 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 campaigns, uh, or or check body temperature at, at stations, and then uh, this is a very Japanese uh, again. How railways should be operated against the COVID. This is uh, Ministry of Land Infrastructure Transport, not guideline, but just uh, uh, say, just I, I, we will note for you, <laughs> just such and such. <laughs> so this is that. This is a railways uh, designated uh, enterprise must keep a business operation and uh, uh, must uh, uh, trip making needs. Uh, uh, to meet trip making needs and then uh, to 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 uh, keep social distancing or, or staff uh, protection etc okay so now ventilation as i told uh, requested by for, for to the passengers and then uh, seat reservations in the limited express uh, uh, or shinkansen all such information are given how dense and then uh, these are, uh, say, splash inf uh, infections, uh, uh, say, uh, alcohol. Okay. Uh, so th these are, are measures, uh, requested measures for users and for employees, many, many uh, others. And uh, this, this I'll skip. And then already, uh, say, big flu, uh, nine, uh, 2011, uh, the, the government tested already uh, to. Uh, to be safe, uh, one meter, uh, to, to keep one meter, 68% of passengers should be reduced, two meters, 82%. And uh, uh, like this. And then, if in the case, if 40% of staff cannot work, then uh, to, to keep one meter, 84% uh, uh, passenger should be re reduced, etc. And then finally, <clears throat> this is a summary. So, uh, so first one is uh, preparedness, preparedness. Okay. So already uh, done, uh, 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 the government did the testing uh, before, and then during, uh, say, COVID-19, so so to, to protect, so step was one, two, sorry, one, two, three, four step. The first one is uh, measures for employees and the users, which I talked, and then, then avoid the trips, uh, telework, sorry, telework, and then, then the shift is stuck, the commuting, and then stop is a stop, unnecessary uh, and uh, urgent trips. And after COVID, uh, we might have uh, uh, financial measures to compensate the losses uh, for the operators. Oh, this is another uh, rather strange one, the go to travel. And then the government support uh, traveling, 30% uh, uh, or 40% of fares or hotel uh, costs will be covered by the government. This is to recover the, the uh, uh, infected, uh, uh, say, uh, hotels or tourist uh, uh, regions uh, recommended to do this. But uh, the, the, the citizens in Tokyo prefecture uh, was not uh, given this merit because the uh, infection rate was very high. You, you have to stop here. <laughs> so non-infected uh, uh, region citizens can enjoy uh, this uh, subsidies. Okay, so deregulation for new transport logistics, etc., and the online order. Uh, this is okay. So Japanese uh, government is uh, have uh, many uh, regulations, but uh, uh, as uh, uh, an exception, uh, on all the uh, food delivery, it, it was uh, not uh, allowed before, but it's allowed now. Or freight transport by taxi. Uh, or promotion uh, for inbound, etc. Now uh, Shinkansen now is bringing uh, fresh uh, fish, 
uh, using a passenger seat, uh, vacant cars, <laughs> we can do it. Or in, in TJB, for example, uh, they transported infected people. Okay, so uh, we had, the, I had, I conducted the high speed, I, I will stop in one minute. Uh, high speed rail conference uh, last week, uh, together with the ADB, Asian Development Bank uh, uh, Institute. It's interesting. I found that uh, trains is a very, very flexible. So this car is used for ordinary people. This car is an infected patient. That can be done. But in the airplane, one body, it's very difficult to segregate, separate the air. So, uh, the, the, so far, uh, train service has become uh, recovered uh, much faster than airlines. And uh, uh, of course, uh, they, they are, uh, railways are much more uh, carbon, uh, say, low carbon uh, system. Okay, so now uh, I, I have to stop. Downsized should be accepted, okay and the peak cut, uh, resilient. Uh, and I propose reversible society or reversible transport system. And then finally, uh, how to leave uh, uh, Anthropocene. <laughs> uh, say I have to stop now, but uh, uh, say mindset is uh, very, very necessary. Thank you. Uh, a bit uh, talk too much, sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Yoshi. Fascinating presentation. It's always very interesting to hear uh, from very different contexts um, compared to where we live. Um, so um, just looking at the Q&A, uh, we have one question, which is probably it merits a bit more broad uh, response. Uh, so we will do that after the two presentations. But just um, uh, very quickly, if you had to um, um, summarize your response in one sentence, uh, what would you say will the observed changes in traveler behavior return to previous patterns in the long term future? So, so sorry, sorry. Can, can, uh, where can I? Uh, you you are now uh, interpreting, okay, for me, so, because I cannot find the uh, questions. <laughs> um, so, um, can I see the questions on the screen? Yes, you can, Yoshi. It's uh, on the Q&A box, which is uh, to the right at the bottom. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's called Q&A, uh, bottom of the screen. Mm, sorry, uh, I'm not very good. So, uh, okay, P please uh, so tell me. Yeah, the question very briefly is just whether you think that um, these changes in traveler behavior Let's focus on Japan now. Uh, will they return to the previous pattern in the long-term future? Or do you think some of will stick? Okay, uh, the, the answer is no. Okay, and uh, for example, JR uh, East president uh, made a press conference. Uh, we don't think uh, the, 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 the previous volume of passenger will not come back. So uh, from uh, the, the two, maybe next year, they will uh, uh, say the, the last train uh, operation will be uh, much earlier. So they will cut such services. So, uh, and also they, they are now thinking uh, time, day of time uh, differentiated the fare rate. So such kind of uh, measures, uh, the, the operators are seriously think and, uh, and propose. Yeah. Uh, great, thank you very much. Um, I think we can return to this question in the Q&A later on as well. Uh, probably yeah. there are a lot, there's a lot to, to talk about there. Uh, but um, we have a second speaker today. So moving on, um, our second speaker today is Professor Bert van V, uh, is a professor at Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands. Bird has taken up various influential roles in informing Dutch national policymaking in transport and land use, as well as the OECD. He is director of the Netherlands Research School for Transport, Infrastructure and Logistics. Um, and in his talk, Bert will argue the need for a new generation of land use and transport models 
that can adequately address a series of policy questions raised by contemporary trends. Um, Yoshi, if you could um, stop sharing your screen, uh, we can move on to Bert's presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Etimea. I will start sharing screen. Move to the first slide. I was just updating a little bit. Are my slides clearly visible? Yes. Okay. Uh, what I'm going to, to talk about is an updated version of a paper I published in 2015 in the Journal of Transport and Land Use. It's about the future of LUTI models. I have to be uh, clear, although I'm a geographer and I study transport and land use interaction, I never developed a LUTI model myself. But I'm heavily involved in strategic policy making in the Netherlands in the areas of transport and land use. And I really am interested a lot in what policymakers want and need and other decision makers and what they expect from researchers. Uh, from that perspective, I recently chaired a committee that had to advise on the future of the Dutch LUTI model. What is LUTI about? Here you see six pictures, six maps of the western part of the Netherlands from 1960 to 2010. As you can see, urbanization really um, took a lot of additional space in those five decades. And as research has shown, uh, the urbanization was influenced by the transport system, but also vice versa. Uh, some of you might have seen the publications of Dana Kazarayan, where she explored those data over 60 years. I will start with the conclusion, then introduce the topic, underpin the conclusion, reflect on policy implications, and finally summarize the implications for LUTI models. So uh, for those who think it's too tiring to listen for too long, at least you get the conclusions, I hope. My first conclusion is that I think we need a new category of land use transport interaction models to deal with trends like peak car, decline of population, shop services, etc., the impact of information and communication technology on our activity patterns and travel behavior, cycling, autonomous vehicles, and maybe COVID-19. My second conclusion is that we have a lack of empirical evidence to underpin how all these trends work out in the long run. The best we can do is what if simulations uh, changing parameters and Michael Wegener already touched upon this last week and I fully agree with him. We started developing LUTI models um, long ago in an era of growth, more people, higher incomes, more urbanization and the question and more infrastructure, by the way. And uh, the question is, how did the growth in the transport systems influence land use and vice versa? Nowadays, it's not only about growth anymore. There are some trends challenging that paradigm. First of all, it's not only about more residential areas, commercial areas, work areas, etc., but it is also about the adaptations within the current land use system, especially in regions like in Europe, Japan, some areas in the USA, uh, it's more the dynamics within the urban system than extensions of urban systems only. Secondly, those changes are linked to many, many new policy questions, policy questions that relate to redevelopment of urban areas, questions that relate to social exclusion, such as in some US cities where all shops, schools, etc are gone and you really are in a kind of a getaway, you cannot have access to any opportunity nearby. It's also about questions on whether or not to stop public transport services. Some economists might argue, okay, no problem because there is symmetry in behavior. I argue uh, there is no symmetry in behavior. Growth does not have the same impact on the land use transport interaction as decline. And I will come back to that point later on. 
at the right hand uh, the top, you see the, uh, a closed metro station. So it was a metro station, it's not anymore. How does it influence land use? Is it equal to building a new station? It's about the closing down of shops and services. It's also about redevelopment. At the left corner, you see uh, the Zollverein, uh, the German Ruhrgebiet, um, originally a building for the uh, coal and steel industry, now a place with um, ex expositions, um, museum, small enterprises, artists, etc. Completely other function of the same building. The problem is, what will those trends do in the future? We do have some studies, for example, on PCAR, showing that younger generations are less car oriented than older generations, um, but, uh, even when they are at the same age. But that does not prove a lot about the dynamics over time. Uh, so we lack data of changes underpinning the parameters of LUTI models. Therefore, the only thing we can do, I think, is explore futures, do what if calculations, what if some trends would uh, stop, what if they would become stable, what if, if they would intensify in the future. We can explore what that would imply for the interaction between land use and transport. What I also think is that the next generation of LUTI models should have a wider set of accessibility indicators. What is the transport and land use system all about? It's about providing people access to destinations. I really like the paper recently published by Susan Handy, who also plead for accessibility as opposed to mobility, we should focus on accessibility. This means that we have to select which indicators. Maybe we should explicitly uh, provide indicators on potential accessibility, maybe even including access via ICT. Maybe we need indicators for the possibilities of activity patterns, like in time geography. We probably need to disaggregate between groups of people and maybe also between areas especially if fairness is at stake, who will benefit, who will not benefit. We need to uh, make that explicit. There is also challenges with respect to the monetary value of accessibility, like in the LOXM indicator. Maybe we need accessibility indicators showing us to what extent we can substitute activities or travel options. So we do the same activities, but at other places, we might go to another shop, if some shop closes down, maybe we might, we might switch modes if needed. We, I call that substitutability. What we also need is how do key actors in the transport and land use system interact? We poorly understand our current models are mainly about empirical data on land use and transport, but not the drivers behind those changes. And I think we need dynamic visualizations. Tables and text are less convincing to many clients of our research, I think, than visualizations. And these should preferably be dynamic. A lot of what I say, by the way, does not only apply to LUTI models, but also to conventional transport models. I will now continue underpinning the trends that I briefly touched upon uh, earlier. First of all, peak car. PCAR is about the fact that younger generations are less car oriented than equally old generations in the past. Some people have argued that it is all about the crisis. Because of the, price, the crisis, the economy went down, less people had jobs, young children stayed at their parents' home and their parents already had a car, so they did not need one. But that probably only explains part of the phenomenon. The reason is that PCAR started earlier than the financial crisis. So the crisis cannot fully explain that trend. What it means is that the parameters of what we call homogeneous groups of people in given circumstances probably are not stable, whereas we assume those parameters to be stable in most modeling exercises. But we do not know what the future will bring. If you're interested, maybe have a look at the special issue published in Transport Reviews in 2013. This is a graph for the US. It's the annual vehicle miles driven 
per household, per driver's license holder, per person, per vehicle. And as you can see already in 2006, uh, the trends went down, whereas the crisis started around 2008. What would that mean if people would remain to be less car oriented? Maybe the importance of the road network on land use might become less important, uh, uh, might, might be reduced compared to what it used to be in the past. It's a hypothesis. Then demography. Increasingly areas face less growth or even a decline, although there is huge regional heterogeneity. The strongest example is from Japan. You see Japan forecast here on the, in the picture. Uh, between 2000 and uh, 2100, maybe population size will reduce by 15%. So that raises questions on how to deal with that decline. And what does it mean for land use and transport interaction? I think that there is no symmetry in, uh, with respect to growth and decline. The first one is sunk cost. That's an important reason. Once you, for example, already built a railway line of a motorway, you do not get your money back by demolishing it. So we will probably not get rid of infrastructure, even if we would never have built it, knowing what we currently know. And another reason is that behavior is not symmetric. People respond differently, to, for example, to income increases than to income decline. Uh, for those interested, uh, I provided a few references. This applies to car ownership. If your income increases, you might buy a car. Once your income decreases, you will not immediately sell it for a lot of reasons. Those reasons apply at the individual level. You're used to the car or even addicted to the car. But it also applies to the impact of car ownership and use on the land use system. People of the land use system adopted to cars and will not e immediately adapt if fewer people would have a car. Then information and communication technology. So this is about e-working, e-shopping, e-learning. As we know from liter literature, ICT can be a substitution. It can be complementary for on-site activities, and it increases what we call fragmentation. Helen Kuklelis did some uh, groundbreaking work in that area. Um, but we do not know if the results from the impact of ICT on behavior in the past apply also for the future. Maybe the better the quality of information and communication technology, the better it can become a substitute for on-site activities. A bit speculative, but maybe in the long run for our social activities, we want uh, people and destinations to be nearby and to be accessible by other modes than by the car only. But for utilitarian trips like working or uh, education, maybe ICT can better than in the past substitute travel. I also think that ICT is a nice way to reduce social exclusion. If you're living in the countryside and you need to see a family doctor and you can contact the doctor online, that really might be a good alternative if the doctors would uh, move away from that rural, rural area, for example. Probably in the future, we will have less shops that will, of course, result in inner city dynamics. Maybe we go to what we currently call shops to ask for information and advice so that we can see products, feel them, and we might buy them online. So maybe you just pay for the service of the information. That would, of course, have implications for goods transport, both goods taken by people themselves as well as by companies delivering goods. Maybe car accessibility of those locations will become less important because people want the places to be attractive. The term fun shopping expresses that. For Luti models, it's still not possible to say what the future will bring. What if is the best we can do? E-mobility, it's about e-bikes and e-cars. For bikes, the range will increase because of uh, electric support. But for cars, the range will decrease. Um, so we need to understand the impact of a range on activity patterns and next the importance of 
specific modes for land use transport interaction. Some people argue that we already have many data sets, but the problem is that the behavior of the early adopters often does not apply to what would happen if we would all have electric cars, for example. Uh, some of you might be familiar with the Rogers curve. Rogers distinguishes innovators, early adopters, the early and late majority and laggards. And uh, the scarce research that has, has studied to what extent the behavior and preferences of people using the same technology varies over time. That research shows that the characteristics of the early adopters are sometimes significantly different, different from the late majority, for example. So even if we have data for early adopters, it's not sure that we can apply those data to what would happen if everybody would, for example, buy an electric vehicle. Electric mobility might influence our mode choice. It could also uh, generate more travel, for example, because the e-bike increases our range. Uh, also policies matter is, for example, restrictions to fossil fuel uh, driven cars only if, if we would only allow e-bikes in our centers that of course matters a lot for our mode choice and the vehicle type choice. If we would have separate lanes for e-bikes that would matter. And I think the lesson for looting models is that very likely the implications are very area specific. There are probably not rules of thumbs that you can easily apply anywhere. The revival of the bike, not only in European uh, cities and regions, but also in the US, even Los Angeles had very nice plans to promote cycling. New York already implemented several uh, policies. Um, uh, John Booker and Ralph Buller wrote a very nice book on cities and cycling in 2012, or actually they edited it. A new book is for, forthcoming. That's a very nice introduction uh, into the area of what's going on with cycling. What is important is that cyclists want destinations to be at close distance, in prox near proximity to where they live. What also matters is that the quality of the envi urban environment matters. It matters for people whether or not to cycle, and cycling also influences the quality of the urban environment. Most people prefer to see pedestrians and cyclists over vehicles. Of course, policies could then reallocate space to cyclists at the cost of cars. So there could be also policy uh, factors influence, influencing the role of the bike. Overall, the message for Luti models is that they should focus more than most models currently do on short distances and on walking and cycling. Autonomous vehicles, uh, it seems that the spatial implications could be very area specific, but a study of Milakis et al shows that even the experts really differ in their opinions on the long-term spatial implications of autonomous vehicles. Um, it could be that because of autonomous vehicles, society will become more car oriented because we move from, from public transport to cars that would increase the importance of roads for land use but on the other end travel times count less because you can make your time productive in the car or even sleep and that could maybe downplay the role of roads on land use again what if is the best we can do then COVID-19 I really like the question raised by Michael Wegener uh, after the presentation of Professor Hayashi. Uh, we do not know, but we can reflect. Some of you might be familiar with the theory of habitual behavior. Uh, that theory suggests that we need to have new behavior for at least uh, one or a couple of months to uh, uh, make our travel habits adapt. To, uh, to new circumstances. But as Professor Hayashi has shown, uh, the uh, COVID-19 era now lasts, lasts already several months, long enough to um, change habitual behavior. Next, there are good reasons that our attitudes change. Some of you are, who are familiar with the theory of planned behavior probably know that attitudes are important for behavior. That theory assumes attitudes to be constant, I argue they are not. Based on an old uh, book chapter of Eagley and Chaiken of 1993, 
I developed the model that you see here together with Jonas de Vos and Kees Maat. We argue that attitudes can change. COVID-19 is a trigger. Because of COVID-19, we might have new knowledge, for example, about online tools like Zoom, what we currently apply, changing our attitudes towards online activities. It could also be that we use those tools, we have experiences, and our experiences change our attitudes. And it could also be that we are affected emotionally. I know some people who really hate working online because they cannot drink a cup of coffee with their colleagues. So they might become more negative about online activities. But overall, the research that I've seen very recently, again, a paper from Australia by David Henscher and colleagues, is that most people are quite positive about our online activities. Overall, I think attitude changes could be uh, could play a role because of COVID-19 and there could be some lasting implications. But I mistrust all forecasts suggesting that we would spend less time on travel. I think we will spend our time differently. The theory of constant travel time budgets so far has proven to be very robust. On average, we spend 60 to 75 minutes per person per day on travel. And I don't think that COVID will change it. We might replace, uh, maybe we work for, at home for three days a week. We travel to work two days a week, but then we accept longer uh, commute distances. We might move to other dwellings further from uh, our jobs, or we might accept jobs further from home, or we might do something in the evening because we are working at home all day. Next topic is the policy relevance of what I've presented so far. Urban redevelopment definitely needs to be supported by what does what do changes in the transport system imply for land use and vice versa. Also, how to deal with population decline? Should we leave the implications to the market? Should policymakers intervene? Should we, for example, uh, give new destinations for empty offices? Should we make student housing of that offices? Which offices? Where? Should it be supported by policies or left to the market? There is also the risk of social exclusion in areas of decline. Should policymakers intervene? How? Which policies? Which options are there? Which effects? Also, uh, in countries like the Netherlands, there is an increasing debate about future infrastructure, especially roads and railroads. Are further extensions no regret? Our networks are quite complete. We expand the capacity to reduce congestion for in the peak hours. But if we would travel fewer kilometers in the peak hours because we work at home or we start working at home and then move to our, our jobs later on on the same day, you need less infrastructure to fight congestion. Also policies with respect to public transport. Should we close down services? Where, when, to what extent? Uh, all very relevant policy questions, and to make it even more complicated, those topics are often interrelated. The closure of public transport uh, services might, for example, raise equity concerns, to give just one example. Next topic, we need to understand what our clients want and need. All that we do in the area of Luti model is to support decision making. We need to understand what they want in which form? Is it a report or a video or a presentation? Do they want the information at the individual level? Do they want group presentations or discussions? We need to realize that Luti decisions are often multi-stakeholder decisions and those people interact. So we need to understand which clients of our modeling exercises do want which information, uh, when, how, etc. A lot of our clients hate uncertainty. I've been involved in many debates where policymakers ask, okay, but what is the average forecast? They prefer one future. But of course, that's an illusion. That's, there's external uncertainty with respect to the economy, demography, technology, and we generally have scenarios for that. There is model structure uncertainty, probably a little bit less relevant, but there are still several debates for example, about the role of residential self-selection. 
Then there is uncertainty about the mathematical formula that, that we use. We generally base the shape on empirical data, but we poorly know for future trends. The main problem is uncertainty with respect to the coefficients. If we need to base them on data and we don't have data for the future for new trends, that is really a huge uncertainty. And what is even more complicated, uh, I think, is to transfer from one country or region to another. We have done this for four-step models. And to be honest, the uncertainty with respect to the impact of generalized transport costs on mode choice is relatively small. But the parameters of looting models really vary between those models. So you cannot easily uh, adapt parameters from another region at another time. My personal idea has changed over time. Until maybe a decade ago, I thought we should explore the future, Monte Carlo simulations or many scenarios and make explicit the ranges. Uh, but now I have changed my opinion after many debates with policymakers. Now I think we should communi communicate under which conditions you would have come to other conclusions. Would, under which conditions would you close down that station or would you build a new station or would you um, reallocate road space? So it is more the departure of the decision at stake and then reason back under which scenarios conditions would you probably come to another decision? That is the main thing they want to know. To summarize, we need way more than in the past what if calculations. We need to include more accessibility indicators. We need to better understand the role of key actors. I think we should combine looting models and expert judgment, for example, with respect to the trends. And we need to pay way more attention on how to present the output and what to do with visualizations. Then a remark on the conceptual structure of a lot of Luti models. Andre Lopez et, and other authors developed this model. They say Luti is all about the transport and land use system and the interaction, but it is also about the activities. So which companies are in which offices, which people live in which uh, houses. And he says we should explicitly uh, model the interactions also with respect to activities. And in each box, there are supply demand interactions. And he reviewed uh, the mainstream LUTI models, arguing that several of those LUTI models miss some of the key components. You might think that I now plea for activity based modeling because of the dominant role of activities in that graph. I think these are conceptually very attractive, but I'm not sure if progress is far enough. Uh, so far, a lot of activity-based models have disappointed a little bit because it were only relatively small contributions. I know people who are very optimistic and who think that data problems will be reduced in the future. Um, I don't know. I think a lot of theoretical barriers still exist. Thank you for your attention. And I think I should now stop share screen and see if there's any questions. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Bert. Um, I agree that it's uh, very important and interesting to look at uh, models from a perspective of considering them as evidence for policymaking. So um, we have a lot of questions actually, uh, but um, just uh, for clarification, um, I would like to draw out one which um, essentially asks you to clarify your position on the interaction between the peak car trend that you mentioned and COVID-19. Um, so um, it says recent peak car trends may very well be reversed due to ongoing speculative fear of shared modes um, as zero car households are considering purchasing a car and in some cases have already done so. And assuming that a LUTI model has been calibrated for peak car, this behavioral change would be an exogenous shock. So what strategies would be useful for modeling such an anticipated shocks? Yes, a very good question. Uh, what you can do is indeed look at the parameters of homogeneous groups of people and what did they do with respect to car ownership, one car in the household, multiple cars. You can even include car sharing as a kind of a mode option. And you could then explore, uh, will that trends intensify or not? We can study to what extent COVID-19 
did influence uh, car ownership levels of young people or sh uh, car sharing levels. And based on the empirical insights, we probably can do some what if exercises. As we have seen in the pre presentation of uh, Professor Ayashi, some people might move from the car uh, to uh, active modes for public transport to the car. So there's many complex changes in behavior. And I'm not, uh, what he also showed is that the changes are very region specific. So again, you cannot easily uh, adapt the findings from a study of Japan to Denmark or vice versa. So we really need to do empirical research to understand what's going on. And then via what if calculations, we can explore futures, I think. Thank you, Bert. Um, um, so we have a lot of other questions. I think um, that uh, before we start discussing these, um, I would like to um, invite our discussant, Ian Williams, uh, to provide his comments on the presentations before moving on to the main Q&A session. Uh, Ian is a veteran modeling researcher and practitioner who has worked on LUTI models for over 40 years, both at the University of Cambridge as well as in consultancies. And today he continues to work in this area, leading his own firm. Ian, over to you. Ian, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, great. Ah, okay, sorry. I don't know what to, anyway. Uh, I want to summarize the implications of two very stimulating presentations. And it's really looking at it from the point of view of the types of models that we urban modelers should be providing. Because the first talk by Yoshi looked very much at the implications of COVID gave us some useful insights into Japan and also the WCTR information about how things are different in different contexts, I think it is important. This is one of the things I'll be picking up and linking it with what Bert has been saying about transferability of models. Because I think there are some broad ideas for model, urban model design that we need to take into account. The first thing, is something that was already picked up in the first session last week, which is the major short-term uncertainty over how the impacts of COVID will evolve through space and time and how this will change in the short and long term. And this uncertainty really means that forecasts are not going to be that helpful to us. We need to have the sort of what-if analysis that um, has been agreed by others already. I, I subscribe very strongly to that view. Um, that's something which is a change from some of the modeling styles in the past. I think there's another thing that has been focused on in part, and that is the impact of what happens in the future, because one of the advantages of having been involved, involved in modeling for a long time is lots of things that we modeled have remained stable for long periods. But one has got to look and not assume that they continue to be stable because things do change. And there are going to be major changes in the future. We've had an era where the transport technologies have changed relatively little. What we had were a few things over the last 30 years, expansion of high-speed rail supply and major reductions in user cost of air travel. But otherwise, transport technology has improved, got a bit cheaper, but it hasn't changed very much. That will not be the next 30 years. The next 30 years will have major technological change. In the same way, transport costs are likely to change very substantially in the next 30 years in response to climate change. So that's, again, a major change that will come in the future. The reason, basically, the issues in these are the timing rather than the existence of these major changes. 
And that's really the implications of that for land use models is they need to have enough behavioral structure within them to be able to represent how these change may, changes may impact. And that's the main thing that I'll be focusing on in my five minutes worth here. So the conventional pure transport models that are based on re regularities of behavior really will struggle in this context. And there must be more need for land use models to take account of the wider impacts and the larger impacts of these types of situations. Again, not predicting what will happen, but at least looking at what are the logical combinations of things that may happen and giving some sort of scenarios that can then be fed in a consistent and sensible fashion into transport models. So the first question I think that's worth thinking about is, are the types of urban model requirements for representing the impacts of major changes in transport technologies and of major climate change, change related transport costs, are these the same sorts of models that would be also useful to represent the impacts of COVID and of COVID related policies? I think they are. I think what you need are models that have a detailed behavioral structure. So I'd be interested in views from Bert and Yoshi on this and also on from the audience afterwards. It's one thing you might think about. The other is related to this. The range of COVID impacts is large and they differ strongly between contexts and person types. And the WCTR survey that we had were shown earlier is very informative on this front. In different contexts, you get expectations of very different responses. And I don't think that negates the usefulness of land use models, but it does have certain requirements. And I think some of these were hinted at by Bert along the way. I think a crucial element is a need in the models to segment into homogeneous groups. And that is, we need to have groups that behave in a reasonably stable fashion in response to the, you know, sorry, we need to have different population compositions represented because many of the things that appear to be changing are just a result of changes in the composition. You get different patterns in different areas depending, you know, I've seen in the UK, cities like London have changed radically because the proportion of the sort of 20 to 45 year olds has doubled within the city. The proportion of elderly people has reduced greatly. So you just get different patterns. So much of the difference is just due to different demography. So those things we have to take account of. We also need to take account of the differences in land use and su transport supply characteristics and how these change over time or through space. Then hopefully we will have relationships where there is reasonable stability in much of what people do. And then we will be looking at the context in which behavior actually changes. You know, how, which people will respond in which way to COVID. So the young are likely to have different responses. The issues facing those in work are very different depending if you work in an office as we do it makes no difference you know we've we miss out on drinking but i've worked I, you know the last year has been productive for me as you know safe everything people working running driving taxis working in hospitals it's been horrible you know their life has changed completely so we've got to have these distinctions within the model however that then brings me to the second question is if we have models that, for the reasons I've been saying, will increase greatly in their dimensionality because of the need to have homogeneous reactions, is that feasible within the conventional modeling structures that we deal with? Or do we really have little option but to use agent-based models? Because agent-based models allow the sort of differentiation in behavior to take place. However, as Bert has alluded to, 
the progress in providing agent-based models that can provide the same sort of service, not ideal service, but the same sort of service that more conventional models have provided to decision makers. And that has gone a lot more slowly than I had expected. So how do we, you know, I think the pressure is going to increase for that sort of modeling, because I think even with, you know, dimensions explode exponentially. And, you know, you just end up with models where it's all empty, you know, it's, it's not the right way of doing it. So something needs to change in that structure. Those are my ideas to just get people thinking. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian, indeed. Um, I would like to just leave a few minutes to both presenters to um, reflect on those comments. So maybe if we go in the order of presentations, um, Yoshi, if uh, you could reflect on in Ian's comments. OK, thank you. Um, well, ha having heard uh, uh, Bert's presentation and the Ian's comments, uh, uh, one more thing is uh, 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 well, uh, how to trace uh, different differently attributed uh, person uh, to, to react uh, to uh, different policies. And uh, at the same time, uh, not only uh, land use transport modeling, but also the evaluation system of uh, the uh, resulting transport situation and the land use situation is uh, also very important. Um, that, that means, uh, in my sense, very uh, globally or uh, roughly speaking, uh, as possible to uh, increase uh, personal quality of life, at the same time to reduce the burden on the uh, earth, on the uh, society, uh, per person's, uh, one person's say, additions, uh, a kind of ma marginal uh, cost, or cost is too to narrow, marginal burden uh, on, uh, on, on, on the, the government or on the uh, global ecosystem uh, uh, altogether. So uh, that, that is a, a kind of a quality of life approach. And then uh, I think uh, I myself have been doing uh, uh, rather, rather apart, uh, apart from uh, land use transport modeling itself, I have been uh, devoting in uh, quality of life, uh, developing quality of life uh, evaluation system. So that, that is one thing. Uh, and uh, also uh, 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 reflecting also that someone's uh, Dr. Ma's question <laughs> together. <laughs> uh, so many policies are, uh, majorities of policies are to increase or to, to uh, for, for the growth. There are very few uh, policies to reduce the growth or to, to decline the demand. Uh, but now uh, after experiencing, uh, having experienced the COVID, I think uh, there are many uh, policies like that. Uh, one of the most stupid uh, behaviors in 20th century is uh, the workplaces, the com private companies or government, uh, wherever, start at eight or nine and end up at uh, five. That's most stupid. Well, it's very natural. Even uh, say 10 year boy or girl can understand uh, then then two peaks of the day, <laughs> uh, traffic congestion or, or congestion in trains. So the, the most important policy is how to uh, stimulate people, uh, encourage people not to go out at eight o'clock, uh, seven o'clock in the direction of uh, city center. So, um, so I'm developing a, a system uh, together with my student uh, application 
uh, advice uh, to design whole uh, day uh, use of time rather than uh, traveling only. So uh, one of the examples is that the, the system suggests not to go to the direction of city center, you will go uh, 90 degrees different direction and then find out the Starbucks there and work one and a half hours. And maybe later the system will uh, call you, oh, this is a good timing to, 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 to go to the uh, city center, uh, your office, like, like that. So uh, in, in such a way, I think, that, that, and also combining with uh, also uh, the congestion charge in public transport fares, or uh, like London, uh, congestion charge uh, uh, for cars. So as a whole, the whole Sophia uh, space uh, pricing, like, like sp uh, pricing is uh, very important because we are land use transport modelers or planners, not only transport, but not only land use. So whole spatial uh, interactions or uh, space, uh, say asset or value of space, how uh, fully well utilized uh, for the society or for the ecosystem. That, that's my comment, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Yoshi. Uh, Bert, do you, uh, would you like to reflect on Ian's comment? Yes, uh, thanks, Timea. And thanks, Ian, for your very nice reflections. I think very, Timely topics, uh, completely agree. Your first uh, question is, would the implications of new technologies and COVID be comparable as far as the implications for looting models are? I'm not fully sure, to be honest. Many of the technology changes can be translated into terms of options available for people. For example, if we want to introduce the Hyperloop, it can be expressed in terms of generalized transport costs. Sharing can also be seen as a new mode with each individual, uh, well, all kind of uh, generalized transport cost implications. And I think we can quite adequately deal with such new options within the current model structure and way of thinking. COVID will probably mainly uh, have an impact via attitude and preference changes. That's a bit different, difficult, a bit different because it's characteristics of the people. And of course we have those people in our models but the impact of the uncertainty what will COVID-19 bring uh, should be modeled in another way, I think, as the implications of new technological options. So they, they both have in common that they challenge the current models and we need to adapt. Uh, I, but I think the way it works out differs a little bit, either via supply of options or via attitudes and preference of people. That's the difference, I think. Then segmentations, I fully agree. Of course, we already have segmentations in homogeneous groups of people with respect to social, economic, and demographic variables. That's the common way of modeling. Uh, what I currently think is that to better understand what are the most relevant segmentations, we might need to do more with respect to latent class models, uh, not only based on social, economic, and demographic variables, and maybe even latent class transition models which clusters of people move from one class to another class. I really understand it's more easy for me to say so than to build this in the models. It's a lot of work, but maybe latent class transition models could add to our way of modeling the land use transport interactions. And what I would like to add to segmentations is to also make segmentations to report the effect, not only segment because we need to understand behavior, but also what do the results imply for different groups of people. Even if low income people without a car would behave quite differently, we still need to know what do these land use changes or transport system changes imply for people without a car and, but having a low income. So I like to segment both to understand behavior as well as to report on a disaggregated level. Then your question on activity-based models. In the committee that I told briefly about before, of, at the beginning of my presentation, we also discussed this. And after some debates, we decided not yet. 
activity-based models are very promising, but if they will be developed, it's not because of LUTI, we might have to follow if progress would be way stronger than in the past two or three decades, then maybe in the future LUTI models uh, could benefit. In this stage, the additional cost, because of the complications that uh, Ian already reflected on, probably outperform the, the additional benefits. So I would not advise yet to transfer LUTI models to activity-based models in this stage. That's my brief reaction. Uh, thank you very much, Bert. So um, with that, um, I think uh, it's best to turn on to the questions that we received from the audience. <clears throat> and um, I think we have two questions which uh, have already been to some extent answered, and also they are quite uh, related to each other. So I would ask them um, as, as one, really. Um, so there is a question about um, how important will past trends be uh, or how useful they will be to predict future uh, with respect to land use and transport interaction for the coming decades. Um, so how much we can rely on the past information. And I think that a, a very relevant comment in relation to that is uh, how, I, how might we validate LUTI models to be more confident in conclusions that emerge? Anybody would like to pick that one up? Yeah, very good questions. Uh, the scarce literature that I know that looked at parameters for LUTI models over time suggests that they are not stable. The importance of the railway system, for example, in the US was way larger uh, until maybe uh, 75 years ago or 100 years ago than it currently is. Um, also, the importance of more trans or road transport infrastructure has declined. So the impact of additional extensions of the motorway system on land use has declined over time. Uh, so um, you can look at previous trends, but you not, should not simply apply elasticities or so based on previous trends. You should look at the theoretical explanations for what you find. And if you look at those explanations and you would extrapolate, then you will probably come with better uh, parameters. But don't simply cut and paste parameters of trends in the past. Um, so the validation uh, for many of those trends, we do not have the data even to calibrate models, let alone to validate them. So that is still not doable as far as the new trends are concerned. Uh, what I personally like is validations uh, from uh, experts. Do they think that the parameters are quite plausible looking at the theory what explains the trends over time. So I, I used to think that we should validate based on additional data sets. I changed over time and I think we should validate based on the theory explaining those trends and probably ask experts. That's my first reaction. Thank you, Bert. Um, is there maybe something that Ian, Yoshi or Ying would like to add to that? Okay. <laughs> Great, so um, let's move on to the next question then, uh, which is, um, I'm just reading this one. Uh, there has been a concern about the decline of the high street for some time. And it seems to me that all COVID is uh, likely to do is hasten the inevitable decline. And this is something that we just ought to learn to live with. So this uh, doesn't bother me. On the other hand, the suggestion that public transport will go into a permanent decline with closed stations, EDC, seems to be a rather more worrying as it goes against various other policy objectives, for example, green policies. Um, is this very justified, do you think? Uh, I don't even know what is meant by the decline of the high street. <laughs> so for me, it's difficult to answer the question of Tim, maybe because I'm not a native speaker, maybe Ian or Yoshi know what is meant by the decline of the high street. And you would you like to comment? Yes, I mean, it's that the usage of shops has reduced greatly in the UK. So the number of people traveling into city centers for purposes related to retail has gone right down and all the other services associated with that has reduced. And in some instances, there may have been some increase in carborne out-of-town shopping, but even there, I think there have been major reductions. 
So part of it has been in big cities, a reaction against the use of public transport, which is the main mode available for the large cities. And part of just people um, finding online shopping is something they've had to do. And once they've done it, it's easier to do it a second time, going back to the point you made about things not being reversible. It takes a lot more to get first a person to make their first online order than to make their second online order. And that has really hit a lot of the high street. And that I think is something that the future will not be the same as the past. Yeah. And that combined with questions over public transport, particularly if the efficiency of public transport and it's, you know, already of issues in the UK where the privatized rail service has effectively returned to the state because they have to pay the costs to support the railways when there aren't many passengers. So if in the future, as Yoshi was also talking about, the costs of rail go up to help cover some of the inefficiencies that have been caused by COVID related issues, does that again add another influence to make city centers less attractive than places that are car accessible? Maybe a brief reflection on the topic, not really a perfect answer to the question. I studied geography between 1976 and 1983. And by then there was a huge debate, at least in the Netherlands, but probably also abroad, about changes in urban centers. What happened? People who lived there, um, um, had to move because the houses were transferred into offices and shops. And people complained about it. It was a very bad thing. Uh, people are uh, moved out of the city center. It's very antisocial, blah, blah, blah. I sometimes ask the question, why? This is dynamics, but why is it bad? Of course it's bad. What we now see is the opposite. We have fewer offices in some city centers. Uh, previously being houses, and they are sometimes converted to houses again, or shops that are converted to houses or whatever other destination. There seems to be a kind of conservatism uh, in the heads of many people that changes are bad in itself. I'm not convinced. If high streets would change to other functions and it would still be lively and we all think it's good, I don't care. I mean, not a priori. If we would have ghettos or those areas would we would have many empty shops without any replacement function. That, of course, is bad for the center. But we should be a little bit careful with our normative judgment on some of the changes that we currently face, I think. May I uh, a little bit uh, comment? Uh, uh, yes, please. Yeah, uh, I think uh, now, uh, again, having experienced the COVID uh, neighborhood, uh, is uh, becoming again uh, very important. So when we think uh, lockdown or, or restriction of movement, uh, just walking distance, uh, say necessary, daily necessary good should be, uh, say, can, can be, we, we can uh, buy. So uh, in many cases, uh, after using uh, cars, many things are dispersed. Disperse is okay uh, if locally compact, but uh, all uh, everywhere dispersed. Now, that's very bad. So this is a good chance to rethink neighborhood and also uh, say central place theory, uh, crystallized, say uh, in Germany, Berlin, Hamburg, Munich uh, are the first center where uh, everything is uh, uh, available. It's a very high level uh, uh, medical care, uh, university clinic, or opera house, uh, or football uh, stadium, everything. But uh, the second and third is uh, uh, not. Uh, I think uh, rural Gebiet, rural area is a good example uh, where I also lived uh, to, <laughs> near uh, Michael Wegener. So in Dortmund, say very big 
super stadium of uh, football. While uh, in uh, Bochum, the next door, they have small theater playing uh, uh, the uh, uh, Goethe Schiller uh, plays like that. So th they are all complementary. So uh, it's, it is not daily uh, need, but uh, maybe once a month, uh, but once a month, uh, need can be uh, given by the others. So that is the role of transport system network. The role, role of network is uh, transport network is uh, to give chances to share the others provision of services. So uh, if uh, hospital is not in, in your uh, backyard, then, then you can go uh, to the other place. But again, uh, the impedance or, or uh, say curve of uh, availability may be different for, for me, old man, and uh, for uh, uh, Timea, young lady, different. Okay, so young ladies may wish more uh, shops rather than hospital, uh, uh, say access, uh, better access. It's uh, so in that way. So uh, that's why I told the uh, evaluation uh, by different uh, attribute person is also important. So the well uh, combined uh, land use transport model and uh, uh, evaluation system is uh, very important. So then, then that is also very necessary to check the uh, achievement of uh, uh, SDGs. SDGs are one of the most important in, in my sense is uh, no one left behind. So don't leave uh, old, old men, okay? But at the same time, uh, the, the policy should be also good, so and so good also for young ladies, uh, so and so. <laughs> that, that is my... <laughs> idea. So uh, very old uh, fashioned uh, theory, so neighborhood theory and the crystal uh, center of place theory should be revisited. Thank you. Thank you, Yoshi. Maybe just one um, thought to add to that as well, that um, actually um, there is an argument to be made for the death of the high street not actually being people not going there, but rather that high streets are taken or have been taken up by the type of um, shops or the type of offerings or services that are actually very much amenable to online shopping. So you might also see a return to more local shops and more like uh, crafts, hand, uh, handicrafts, these kinds of shops. That is the traditional profile of high streets. So I think um, just relating back to Bert's previous comments about not necessarily always change that isn't necessarily always bad. Um, thank you. So um, I think with that, uh, there is a very interesting question in the in the Q and A, where, which I think is is worth uh, reflecting on a little bit is. Um, a, a bit more understanding of land use and transport interactions as part of a broader complex uh, set of interactions that, that potentially make up the city or uh, infrastructure systems. So the comment is um, land use and transport interactions are just part of various, various interactions as a whole. And whether it is important to examine how much we might have lost or overlooked by, by ignoring other major interactions uh, from other systems that are relevant to either looting models or whether looting models should be better integrated with other systems models as well. Very uh, important question. Ideally, we would like to have one model for everything. Uh, also, not only land use, also transport and uh, includes demography, etc. Well, there is a quite some a consensus that such a huge model would be way too ambitious and uh, com would complicate things a lot. What we can do, what we should do, is to see which other aspects which are not included in the model, LUTI models might influence LUTI models. Next, we should translate the dynamics in those domains to our LUTI models if possible. For example, via scenarios that we assume 
via uh, maybe also we could, for example, as modelers, fix some land use categories. For example, we, because we think keeping open green areas is very important for healthy cities and to adapt them to climate change. Then we should be able to intervene in the multi models to say, here are green parks and there are green parks for that reason. We don't need to model how come, but we should be able to translate, in this case, adaptation to climate change to multi models without necessarily all, including it all in one monstrous model. That is what I think is the best we can do and probably also the most practical thing we can do. But Ian is a real modeler. Maybe he has a different. Um, I, I think I share your views, having been partly responsible for some such monster models. Uh, I would say that what you want to do is model no more elements than are absolutely necessary for what you're doing, but the ones that you need to model, to model those in the best possible fashion. And that I think is the key thing, is things that are left out of the model is not that they're not important, but rather that they may be better handled in some other context. And what Bert has described as a way of handling them. My concern has tended to be that unless within a land use model, you can retain sufficient detail to allow you to actually get at the patterns of behavior and to represent them in a way that maximizes those aspects that are stable through time and that has the mechanisms that allow you to then see which things might change and why they change in one place at a high rate and another place at a low rate. So I think anyone, people starting out with their first one or two models may tend to be global, but once you've done a few of them, you really are trying to see how many things you can get away from to make sure that the things you must do are done well. Uh, maybe uh, a little bit more. Oh, sorry, Yoshi. Okay, sorry. okay, go ahead. <laughs> uh, between 1990 and 2003, I worked for a large government institute modeling the environment. And then we also always have constantly debates on what to integrate in one model. All the debates had to the conclusion we should not go for one integrated model way too complicated but we should make sure that the mod models connect so if you for example have demographic variables you should have the same uh, classes so that you can connect models once you do that you can have separate models for agriculture for industry for energy for transport you can have separate dispersion models for emissions and separate impact models and the solution was not to integrate everything but to make sure you can connect models Absolutely, agree completely. And uh, regarding uh, uh, Professor Yun Nijan's uh, comment, uh, I think it's a very important. Uh, he, he is the, the person who uh, gave me uh, Japanese uh, experiences. He, he made it anyway. Well, now, um, interactions. I think uh, nowadays uh, life uh, is more important. Uh, even more important than around this transport interaction sometimes. So uh, I uh, had, uh, I conducted uh, uh, last Wednesday, uh, say how to create life-centered society rather than economy-centered. The 20th century was, uh, say, to grow economy was the main objectives for a human society. But now we, we know it's a, uh, totally nonsense, it's very, very risky. But uh, make it reverse. Uh, so 20th century was um, uh, people for economy. But now uh, it's a very simple economy for people. So now uh, interaction between uh, uh, human behaviors, including uh, transport behaviors or living uh, behaviors, with uh, ecosystem, total ecosystem is very important. Uh, for example, very, very simply in Paris, uh, London, now uh, PM is uh, increasing again. Uh, and that is a very local uh, pollutants. And the CO2 is uh, making a whole uh, planet uh, strange, uh, uh, very bad. And also, uh, 
transport its uh, responsibilities and not to invade uh, as a nature system, uh, ecosystem, uh, or biodiversity. Uh, if we heard that, then, then that will reflect on the climate change also. Then that will, uh, say, uh, deteriorate our uh, living conditions. So as I told, uh, transport is a means for uh, uh, linking uh, with the others because the others are creating good services, but uh, the others will start to uh, create bad services. Transport system uh, is, uh, uh, is giving reverse uh, value. So minus value uh, straw. <laughs> so, so that is a totally nonsense that our base land use transport modeling will be destroyed. <laughs> so, uh, of course, uh, it's not uh, easy only land use transport modelers to include everything, to, to consider everything. But uh, in, in that case, we can recruit the others uh, talented in different matters. Uh, Junni Jan is uh, one of such uh, persons. So we included, uh, uh, recruit him. <laughs> so that is uh, very important. Also, one more thing is uh, psychology, uh, people's psychology. So by lockdown, uh, so stopping uh, transport uh, means will create a lot of uh, psychological uh, diseases and damages. So that is also uh, very important. So the uh, surrounding or rather more basic uh, conditions to support the land use transport system, that, that's also our responsibility. So uh, psychology is a very, very so important. So uh, we will recruit <laughs> many, many other people. Yeah, thank you. I fully support what Yoshi said about uh, what really matters is not the economy, it's quality of life, well-being, that kind of things. And there is a rapidly growing body of literature in the transport community on these topics. Uh, with people like Jonas Tavos, uh, Dick Etema, many others studying what really matters with respect to quality of life and well-being. And what is nice for Luti models is that accessibility has a positive and a negative impact on quality of life. On the one hand, more travel is more emissions, more noise, more risk, reducing quality of life, but higher levels of access to the destinations improves quality of life. And definitely short distance destinations, short distance destinations where you can walk and cycle to. So the concept of uh, mixed land use, higher densities, etc., that Yoshi reflected on, the, the, the maybe the five Ds of Cervero and Ewing, concepts that are robust in that respect, are nice both for accessibility uh, and for the negative impacts of travel. So we should try to find concepts that um, improve accessibility, but not at the cost of quality of life in other respects. Very nice topic for research. Thank you, Bert. Um, Ying, you're unmuted. Uh, is that because you would like to comment? Yeah, well, just a, a quick comment. And I would like to expand on Bert's and Ian's point of uh, saying that uh, the models should be connected. There should also be a competition of models. And uh, I, the ideal situation is for a very complex topic like density and the environment. Uh, there should be models looking at different pers uh, from different perspectives of um, uh, what is going on. And then to link to the earlier point that Bert has said uh, of uh, validation by experts, because uh, this is really to do with a uh, corroboration. So basically people from different walks of life actually could then uh, look at uh, one issue from different aspects and, and therefore to look at these questions, um, particularly this kind of questions that uh, Yoshi has uh, mentioned earlier um, of that kind of complexity. Right, so if for that I could actually plug something um, 
for what uh, we're planning to do. And this is uh, still in the planning stage. But uh, what I like to do is to um, to say to uh, all the uh, colleagues here participating is that we're thinking of um, calling for um, a young scholars um, a global workshop for young scholars um, on March the 20th, 2021, um, possibly with support of uh, the coupon conference as well to look at uh, new models. And then this call is going to come out quite soon. And the, the young scholars who are under more or less lockdown situations in um, any part of the world, or actually the people who are actually already released from lockdown, I hope that um, you get prepared so that uh, you get this call. And then we also are thinking of prices actually to attract uh, good papers uh, on the spring equinox day of the 20th of um, March, uh, 2021. Uh, so that's a little plug. Thank you, Timur. <laughs> Thank you, Ying. Um, so just mindful of the time, uh, we only have a few minutes left. So um, I would like to um, just call all the presenters and also Ian to maybe provide a, what are the key messages for you um, from today's session? Um, and then we will move on to the informal session, which I will um, further introduce later on. So uh, Bert, what was the, um, key message that, that you would like to take away from this session today? Um, maybe for me personally, uh, the remark of Yoshi that what finally counts is quality of life and well-being. So I see it as a challenging thing to look how well LUTI models, current or new models, would support decision making on the urban environment and the transport system, uh, recreation, anything that counts for, for land use how to support decision making so that we can better understand what matters for quality of life and well-being. That for me is the most important message. Thank you, Bert. Yoshi? Or maybe very similar. So uh, how we can, we can, we means uh, uh, say today, I think uh, comparatively high income people are here. So uh, there are a lot of uh, so people, children living uh, under uh, the critical conditions in uh, developing countries. So even they are more than uh, our population. So uh, land use transport modeling uh, should consider uh, in different situations uh, which uh, uh, Bert mentioned, uh, very different, locally very different. So, uh, as I, so, so you, you mentioned to uh, recruit younger people, at the same time, uh, so uh, un, uh, not, not, not uh, uh, representing uh, regions and countries, we, we have to recruit and then do together and then share uh, knowledge. And then uh, share knowledge means modeling knowledge, we may have more than the others, but uh, reality knowledge, <laughs> knowledge about the reality, we are amateurs. So uh, to do so, uh, we uh, recruit uh, very fresh uh, people, uh, even children uh, to, to, to listen to. Thank you. Thank you, Yoshi. Um, Ian, what is your key takeaway message? I would stick with the theme uh, that, that was raised already about the importance of quality of life. The way I see it is that if you're going to model how things are likely to occur, costs and income have a major impact on it, and also constraints. And we've seen with COVID that constraints you know, that are not cost and income directly related are also important. But I think the cost and income side has effectively hijacked some of the use of the models. It has to be included, it has to be represented well, but it doesn't have to be the way in which those models are evaluated. So I think that point that Yoshi was making, that the evaluation side may need to be thought 
of in a different way, not just what's the cost benefit or all of the other accounting type measures that come out. We've got to look at other aspects as well. Those aspects should be included within the models, but I think not to the exclusion of the traditional economic effects. I think they're critical if you're to have models that will stand up, but those economic effects probably have been overstated when it comes to the evaluation side. Great, thank you very much, Ian. And um, so this um, actually brings us to the end of the formal session today. Uh, so please join me in thanking our speakers, Professor Bert Van Wee and Professor Yoshi uh, Hayashi uh, for their inspiring talks, um, as well as the team of ALM organizers who made this session possible. And of course, the audience uh, as well. So yourselves uh, for the insightful questions and comments uh, that came through the Q&A. Um, so the next session of the ALM 2020 series will take place on Monday the 26th, if I'm right, Ying? Yes. Uh, which will be discussing emerging insights into autonomous driving. And we hope to see many of you again then. And we will now be closing uh, this session and opening the informal session for uh, continuing the conversation. And I would just like to add that I have noted the questions that we didn't manage to answer in this session. Uh, so we will try to go and, uh, and look at those in the next one. Uh, and Timaya. Uh, if I could interrupt just for a second to say that um, from next week onwards, there's going to be a Monday Thursday pattern. So the next one is not on a Thursday, but actually uh, the 26th of um, October is on a Monday. So uh, just that the colleagues that are aware that uh, they will log on the Monday rather than wait for the Thursday. And this pattern is going to continue for most of um, um, in November as well, uh, and then uh, we'll end um, in early December. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. I, uh, the only one thing that I wanted to add there is that Shenzhen uh, has um, added the link to the chat here for the next session, so you can just copy paste it and uh, join us for the informal session. So thank you very much again, and I will be now closing this session. Thank you, giving a very good chance. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> see you, see you actually on the other side, actually in the chat session. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Great. See you. Cheers, bye. Thank you, Timia. Yeah, very yes, nice yeah. mastering. Thank you. Yeah, cheers.